controls in control against our ptosis debate and oh, keep going back and forth. That'll be easy. <laughs> What is up, guys? It is May 2nd, 2013, and this is State of the Game. Me, JP, here on a very, I just, I didn't mean for it to be, but it's a very European themed show. We've got Todd and Kalaris, the two casters from WCS uh, EU, and we've also got a show on. It's 6 p.m. EDT. I don't really understand. I've never done this time slot. We've also got shit going downstairs where people are just banging on tiles and a dog yelping back stairs or back, uh, backyard. So, it's going to be a wild show. And also, QXC, welcome to the show. Welcome back, I guess I should say. Thanks, man. It's been a while. It has been uh, has been some time. So let's just kind of go around here. Kolaris and Todd, how have you guys been? Todd, you first, as the English didn't. I have to. Oh, polite. Oh, sorry, I was watching Climbing the Ladder. Um, I'm doing what? pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Todd, oh, you're off the show. Fuck, get, give me another European. Where's, where's Dark Force? <laughs> we need another one. Dark Force plays League now. Oh, does he really? And Todd yeah. doesn't. Well, he still watches right StarCraft. Well, I'm doing pretty good. I've been casting WCS with Skylaris, and that's pretty much it. Playing some ladder as well, but there was just a reset. Yeah. How's that? Have you played anything since the uh, the reset on any of the new maps? Oh, sadly, I have. Yeah. I think uh, Blizzard enables something when uh, they include new maps on the ladder. So that you get them as much as possible. So basically, every single game that I've played is on the new maps, and it's not been going very well, to say the least, mm. for me. Well, QXC, you're smiling over there. What do you think about the new maps? I didn't even have this in the sh in the show notes, but we might as well okay, talk about so it. So when uh, when NA was still up and before Europe had patched, because Koreans live in the future, I had actually played on those new maps like a couple days ago, and what? they all just seem really good for drops and like spreading <laughs> your opponent out and they're just oh man they're pretty fun good maps i like them good job blizzard <laughs> you like the lava map that seems to be the one that's getting it, the most hate so the thing with the lava map is like you have four bases that are really close to each other but in terms of air none of them like covers a different base like on a killian a killian base like your main if you kind of defend the base like next to you then you're also like kind of defending your main from drops because like they're in a row they're like in a line so like turrets as far out to defend that base defends your main on that lava map like none of the bases are like that you have to defend each one separately from drops it's it's a sick map <laughs> <laughs> oh my god Kolaris, have you played or, or have any thoughts on the new maps I haven't had any chance to play any ladder at all since I've just been working on like notes and stuff like that for WCSEU uh, broadcasts. Uh, and Carmack insists that we get in very, very early before so we can get everything prepped up and good to go. So I haven't had any chance so far. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I think we still need a little bit more time before we can actually have a legit discussion on the map. So let's just jump into our topics as they're is uh, basically just kind of results in, in tournaments going on right now. The DreamHack finished up this past weekend. Um, I got to say, all, all in all, it was kind of what everyone expected. It was a badass DreamHack tournament, which they delivered on. Uh, there were a couple initial delays on the, the first day of the stream. I think it was about an hour and a half. But luckily, NASL was there to kind of stream the games themselves. And it didn't really matter because you could just watch them. So I'm glad that the... The two organizations that kind of got left out, so to speak, by Blizzard are able to work together on something like that. Uh, Todd, you were there. What, what was it like uh, at the actual event itself? Um, it was my first Dream Hack Open. I've been to the main event in Jonkoping, which is like really, really big compared to this one. Uh, you have tournaments on various games. Now, I, I didn't even know what it was going to be like. I didn't even realize there was only a tournament on StarCraft. Yeah. So when I got there, it's seemed significantly smaller than the usual events and I even said it to someone it was like a duh it, this is a dream I hope <laughs> <open>. it's hard so <laughs> I guess uh, 
I was basically explained how how it went from there. Um, the one tournament that uh, we had to play, and as a spectator, I'm sure it was a really good tournament. But for me, as a player, there was some things that uh, I did not particularly like. For example, uh, for the players, we were like set up in straight lines of desks, and the right. audience that came uh, to watch the event, they were very close to us. So there was always discussions going on behind me. Like, I can't stand having two people behind me talking about what I'm doing, what I'm doing wrong and stuff. Uh, I even posed some time to tell them to shut the fuck up. It was like super annoying. But uh, yeah, I think that's like the big thing that bothered me the most as a player there. But there were some pretty good things. Obviously, the PCs were very good. The chairs and table, personally, I, I really liked. Um, for me, it didn't go very well because I have a PS2 keyboard and they didn't have PS2 ports. So I uh, spent the, the entire day looking for USB to PS2 adapter. <laughs> and when I finally found one in a mold that I bought, I plugged it in and it didn't work. So then I was told that the motherboards don't support PS2, so I had to play with a completely different keyboard Wait, than so the one that you... What do you do at like an MLG? Because they don't allow PS2 keyboards at all. The one, the um, one time you went, what did you do? I, I used to have different keyboards. Oh, I changed okay. recently, and also like there is adapters USB to PS2. Just this time, I didn't have it because on my computer I used PS2 directly because it's faster, actually, it's better. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, they didn't have, and uh, in the end, I had to play with different keyboards. I do think I played a little bit worse, but I don't know if I would have advanced because I lost one two to Naniwa, one two to center, and I was one map away from advancing. It was pretty unfortunate. So as a player. Um, not the best experience I've had, not the worst either, I would say. Mm. Do you think, because uh, I, I, I did see the player set up there, how they had you all along that one line, um, which I guess was kind of the entrance hall going into the main tournament. Is that how it was set up? No, no, no. It was like upstairs. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Do you think if they just moved that back a little bit, um, would that have helped? Or do you not like the fact that also players could stand behind you and have conversations during your match? Yeah, I think there should be more room given. Uh, do you, the usual dream hack, what they do is that they do some small lines like they did now, and just above us, they put extra monitors that basically show what we're doing. Uh, it's uh, like, yeah. I don't know how to say, like a replica of our monitor. So people, sure. they can watch from afar and see very clearly what we're doing. There is even some big audience uh, seats and stuff. So Kind of like what MLG it's much does. More convenient. Um, yeah, in a like sense, the, the feature yeah, stations, you, yeah. Yeah, at MLG, you can still be very close to the players as well. That's uh, true, yeah. yeah. On, the, on the stations that they do that on. So I think it's better if, like, as players, we have a little bit more space. Uh, we can't really see anyone around. And uh, we, we can't hear people talking about how fucking bad we are playing, why we are playing. Cause <laughs> Wait, did our, that our happen, people, actually? Uh, some people <laughs> were, like, questioning some decisions, saying, like, he should do this and that. And, like, that's super annoying for a player to be able to hear this. Really, really annoying. That's that's a shame. That's a shame. Yes. Kalaris, uh, did you happen to, to watch a lot of tournaments? What were your thoughts kind of on the production and the overall tournament itself? Uh, I did. I, I watched pretty much the entirety of the DreamHack stream. I didn't really get a chance to watch a lot of the NASL stream. Um, DreamHack's generally always really damn good in terms of the production. The, the first day, um, I was not really blown away by anything. Obviously, they're just like powering through the group, powering through the groups. Right. Uh, I, hmm? I, I just said right. <laughs> like, oh, right okay. There are a lot of games, a lot of, yeah. a lot of matches. Um, and there was quite a bit of downtime, which wasn't really filled. I mean, it's just like any other tournament, really. Um, you do end up having some weird amounts of downtime that you can't really fill too much. Uh, but then when it comes to the actual production on stage, then... They just do what DreamHack do, man. And that eSports money was pretty awesome as well. Yeah. Oh, Jeff, that was good. Um, <laughs> there was something else I was going to say, and I can't remember what it was. Um, God damn it. It was something... It was something regarding... Oh, screw it. I can't remember. <laughs> That's such a QXE quick. <laughs> QXE. There were some Terrans in this, so I guess this is a, an honest question. Did you watch DreamHack? <laughs> Okay. See, I, I tried to set you up for, or try to set the crowd up for maybe a little bit of disappointment, and I'm glad that you delivered. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I, the strategy I use when I decide if I want to watch a tournament and follow a player and see how they did is I wait and see how far they get. And if they get really, really far, 
then I'll go back and like watch their other games. Uh, and Gumiho went pretty far. Yeah. But then he lost to J Dong, and then J Dong lost to Naniwa, and then I was like, well, maybe Gumiho wasn't playing the best. And if I'm going to be watching games to learn, maybe I just watch Pro League or GSL or something. It's true. It's a true statement. So, there were only yeah. two Terran in the top 16. Uh, kind of yeah. an interesting. Interesting note. Um, Todd, did you stay and, and watch after uh, after you were eliminated in group stage two? Did you watch the rest of the tournament? Uh, yeah, I watched a bit, but uh, there was lots of people in the audience, so I didn't really go into like the main audience seats. I was like upstairs. There was some sort of player's lounge, so I watched from there. It was a bit difficult to follow the games very well, or even the commentary, because the sound wasn't as good, but uh, yeah, I did follow some of the games, especially the final ones, like uh, I saw the Naniwa versus Jadong entirely in the grand finals as well. So and Naniwa versus Softoff as well. I feel like DreamHack just gets like the best finals out of any other tournament. For whatever reason, they get yeah. lucky or they have like the perfect setup to have this amazing final. But I, I don't think we could have expected or wanted more out of Lenok versus Naniwa. Going to game five, Naniwa being yes. kind of the, the Swedish... Uh, powerhouse and being in Sweden, um, the only only critical thing I can say, and I, I think this has been repeated a couple other places, is that Lenok was basically like when he won, I felt like no one in the crowd wanted to cheer for him. Like I felt sorry for the guy because <laughs> the casters, like the crowd, no one was cheering for Lenok to win. They all wanted Naniwa to win. And granted, yeah. it, it's in a Swede. Like it, I understand why, but I just felt shitty about that. You know. I don't know but if that's Lino, on the commentators or what. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, one thing that has been mentioned a lot is that uh, people started leaving when Linux had won already. But I remember that I myself was waiting for the last game to finish to leave because it was past midnight already. Sure, it, was it was very, very late. Very late. Yeah. So people have to go home. They might have to do something the next day. Um, I don't know. For some reason, lots of people left and... Usually for the finals of tournaments, I'm not really in the audience, so I don't really follow uh, what's, what happens and if lots of people stay, but I do know that at least some people will leave. But yeah, now it really seemed like everybody was leaving. I really don't know what to attribute this to. Uh, I, I, definitely not the caster's fault. Maybe Linog wasn't talkative enough and he made, didn't make the... He didn't please the audience with that. Like they, they didn't have any particular reason to like him except for his play, but then... I don't know if the games were already over. It was a little bit of a weird situation. Um, I don't think that the Swedish were thinking like, well, you know, he beat the Swedes, so let's just leave. Uh, I think sure. the Swedish audience is very mature, and they cheered very loudly uh, for uh, Linok as well. I think it's probably more of a tiredness. Being there the entire day watching StarCraft games can be tiring as well. Right. I, think, I, I don't think it was malintent, just to yes. retract my statement there. But Polaris, go I ahead. Think, I think there's been a lot of instances, though, when you actually go to these tournaments. Like, it happens a lot at the Intellect Stream Masters as well, when you just have... It doesn't matter who wins. It doesn't matter who it is. Uh, people just don't really like staying for final celebrations and stuff like that. It's very it, true. It happens at yeah. MLG all the time as well. And, and yeah. I think... Uh, I did actually tweet something like... I think I said something like, uh, I wish more people would stay for kind of the award ceremony, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, a lot of people that were actually, I guess, in the DreamHack audience were just saying that the last uh, subway stop was in like 30 minutes after it ended, so everyone was rushing uh, to uh, the subway. So it makes sense. I, I wasn't like criticizing people. It was more that like award ceremonies in this industry have always been shitty, and I don't know how to fix them. <laughs> like, I've produced a man. couple MLG ones, and it's just like, it's just shitty. Like, I don't know how you make it better. I, I guess it, you just have to be there like instantly after they win and do it there, but it's <laughs> just, just shitty. Like pull them straight off the PC. Hey, it's yeah, trophy. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to do it. I don't think anyone's perfected that yet. Um, oh. And and DreamHack did have the uh, awkward uh, champagne thing once again. I wish they would stop doing that because it's really <laughs> weird. <laughs> like Lenok didn't understand. You're supposed to shake the bottle. He was literally like. Forcing the champagne out just by shaking it towards the top and not like it was just bad, man. That has not been a good thing 
What, Dude, up, up until Rice came along and took the trophy off him, I thought he was going to drop the trophy. Oh, yeah, so did he I. Was, he was carrying the trophy with one hand. <laughs> the champagne. It's going to be terrible. It's going to happen live on stream, but it was all okay. Yeah, Thank exactly, exactly. Um, well, I mean, to jump into the actual games, what, what did you guys think of the actual finals? Um, were they good games or were they just exciting games? I guess is the best way to, to start that question. And maybe this is a question for Todd since you said you watched them. There was a Protoss in there, so I know you watched them. I think both. Um, for me, I, ha I had a bet going, which I thought I had won um, in, the, in the second semifinals when Jadong was beating Naniwa. I, I bet on Zerg to win these tournaments mm -hmm. against Forsen, not for much money, but you know, when you're a player, if your race wins, you're happy, but if the other race wins, you get the winning rights, which uh, <laughs> everybody's pretty big on in Europe. So <laughs> I made this bet where basically it was win win. And Jadong, he was about to beat Naniwa, but then he messed up and Naniwa came back. Uh, so that led to a final where Naniwa had to play versus Linok, and Linok was the big favorite in my opinion. But they, they, they went to this game five, and both of them were playing really, really well. Um, Naniwa with his timings, Linok with his read on the game, but ultimately uh, Linok just played a little bit. What, what's the question again? Just the games themselves. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, they were just really good. Um, Naniwa really impressed me because the timings that he hit every single time were perfect and he just read the game so well. He always knew that when he attacks at a certain time pre-ultra, um, if he has a lot of eggs around him about to hatch, he just attacks for as long as possible and then even before the ultras come out, he's ready to recall uh, after having done his Colossus timing. Um, whereas Linok, this new style that we've seen uh, of Zergs going for the mass Zerglings into Ultras, um, it's pretty new and not many players can pull it off very well, but he really showed everyone how to play it and I, I thought that it was pretty impressive to see this, like uh, basically a new style being used super well, that might be the new metagame of a matchup. He's the first guy to really play it extremely well and beat everybody with it. What did you think of the, the constant kind of tech swapping that Lenok was doing there towards the uh, the end of the series. Is that something you think we're going to see more of in that matchup? Yeah, on, on Aquilon, when you're on uh, five bases or six bases as a Zerg versus a four base Protoss, your goal will almost always be to not let him take a force. Try to take some fights. Um, if you max out on Ultra, you're not supposed to beat a fully upgraded Protoss army who's on 200 supply as well. So what you do is that you lose your army and then if you just remake Ultras, you're just going to lose again. But if you do a big switch into uh, lots of Mutas, you've forced a lot of Immortals out of your opponent. So it's necessary to play like that. And Linux execution was just ridiculous. That game on Aquilon was one of the most impressive I've seen recently. And I do think that this is how Zerg needs to be played uh, for the most part in Harder Swarm. With Zerg's opening with like a couple Hydralisks, taking a third base, and then getting a Spire. As a Protoss, if you see that, if you see opponent having the Hydralis Den, the Roach Warren, the Spire, and then say he has two Evos, and he's made already a couple Hydralisks, how the fuck do you react? You can't know if he's going to make Mudas, or, or if he's going to make Roaches, or Corruptors, you can't know until you see them. But when you see them, it's too late already. So Zerg needs to learn how to abuse of that more, and sure. that's what they've been doing recently. Yeah. Um, I guess, Kalaris, did you have any thoughts on, on the finals before I jump to another... Subject of DreamHack? Uh, not, mm, not particularly, no, other than the, the fact that it isn't actually to do with the players, but um, Artosis and Apollo casting together, like, uh, uh, to begin with, didn't really kind of do it for me too much. There was a lot of clashing, I feel. But mm. then when they got into the finals, they really hyped the shit out of that. And sure. it, was, it was really, really nice to hear. Of course, there was the aspect of... You know, it's it's a Swedish crowd there. It's a Swede playing and stuff like that. But had it been any other Protoss uh, at the tip-top level, I'm sure they would have just done just as well a job. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree, obviously. Like, when, when you're casting with someone that you haven't casted with in a long time or someone you're That's just not true. used to, like, you have to, you have to obviously get a couple games in before it really starts to go. But I thought they did. It was a, a probably one of the best casted events I think we've seen thus far, especially the finals. They were... Able to, and I think they talked about this, Apollo said this as well on the, uh, he was a little bit uh, self, uh, not 
promoting maybe i don't know the best word for it but he was very good in the finals they were able to um i thought kind of help the viewer that didn't understand what was actually happening yep. understand what was happening before it would even happen so that was awesome to see um the other big thing that i think was actually the probably the biggest impact this tournament had was seeing game heart in kind of a dream hack or a non gstl environment like God, man, everyone needs to start using that. I don't understand why Blizzard is, like, their new UI is good, but Gameheart is, like, so much better. It's so much, so much better. And I don't know, they'll probably never use it, obviously, but I wish they would. Do you guys have thoughts on, on Gameheart and, like, how good it is? Or how bad Pers it is, rather? What are, what are your thoughts? Personally, I love it. Um, I've actually talked extensively to the creator um, because we were looking into solutions uh, when we were going into WCS EU along with one of two of our admins. Um, it turned out that we weren't able to use it in the end, but the functionality that is there and his support for that functionality is is so good. And I know he was working with alongside DreamHack to yeah. create it, and it's like seamless. You click on an overlord, and there's extra little stats there, which was really, really cool, I thought, and it blended <laughs> in really nicely. But um, for me, leading off of Gameheart being so awesome, I, I, would, <laughs> I would wish Blizzard would give us a bit more support with the custom UI designing. Mm -hmm. Right now, they've given us a few documentations and stuff like that, and it's great, and it's nice. But I personally right now don't feel as if they're giving as much support as they could do with that. Because apparently, according to the GameHeart people, the Blizzard UI can do everything that the GameHeart one does. Sure. So why are we not getting that right now? Right. And it, it might just be like everything else with WCS. It was rushed. <laughs> so maybe we'll see some improvements uh, moving forward. Todd, I haven't really seen any players talk about it. What What is like the player experience with Gameheart? Like when getting in the lobby and all that stuff, is it is is it good? What What are your thoughts? Well, if I had made it to the main stage, I could tell you, but... Uh, oh, they never used it on any of your games? Oh, <laughs> no. I'm an asshole, uh, Todd. I apologize. But talking <laughs> about the overlay that they use on the stream... I think the one that uh, that was uh, on the on the main stage that the overlay that were they were using I'm not, I don't even know how to call it or like how all of this works but I can tell you the Dreamhack stream the overlay was the best that I've ever seen it was yeah every time that I watched the games like it looked pretty close to perfect you could see everything you wanted to see the worker counts uh very important numbers and you never had to press anything um yeah, I was very impressed by that, and I hope that more tournaments uh, use a similar one that the one uh, DreamHack used there. QXC, have you had any yeah uh, any interaction with uh, with Gameheart? No. Man, QXC. <laughs> wow. QXC. I've been. I have been. Barely. <laughs> I see the chat like games. guys. Why is why is QXC not okay? I'll toss QXC a question. Uh, oh okay yeah that's why i was it i have been playing so much the last like i usually i try and split my practice time up where i'm like playing and analyzing and watching games but with the shoutcraft ladder thing i yeah. like, i just i was like all right well i guess all i can do now is play for like a week and a half right so well, i haven't really been keeping up all right so i will i will question the shit out of you when we get into the shoutcraft america part i do want to jump back to the uh to the game heart thing i i felt like when i first saw it that i was going to have an issue kind of readjusting the i guess the mental reflexes of like where to look on the observer ui but it there was the, the only thing that i wonder is like is it giving us too much information to like de-hype the game like mm. where you know wait you you know what's going to happen before it's already going to happen because of all the information available. That's like my only concern, and it's a really small one. I think that the 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 information that they uh, put in, which was like just drone count, and then again you clicked on Novalod and it was like income and something else. Was it just gas income as well? Uh, I'm trying to. Th yes, I think that's it. Yeah. I, I don't mind that too much, although there is that suspenseful moment when you're casting where there's like a load of drones that have died, and then you open up the drones lost tab, and it's like, holy, oh my, he's lost 
fifty thousand drones, and then yeah. you're like, oh whoa, but and then he's got no income, and you're like, oh wow, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, there is that kind of aspect to it that that is always two hand, and it's like, oh well, he's he's lost thirty drones. It's not quite as impactful when uh, when you can see it going down right there and then. Right, right. Todd, do you have any thoughts on that on that topic? Is it too much information? Well, personally, I want to get as much information as possible. When I'm watching right. a replay or a game, I move all over the place. I don't want to miss a single thing. Uh, it will never be too fast for me. But obviously, if I did the same thing on a stream, people would probably throw up. So <laughs> I do think it's a good alternative uh, to not walk, uh, to not move around too fast. And we 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 got good observers uh, in some in some big leagues, but. Is it enough, really, to always highlight the good things uh, that we need to be seeing, like the work account, the income, and all that? If you can put it onto the screen and not have it, uh, have it take too much space, I think it's a good thing. And that's what uh, was done in DreamHack. It was like all at the bottom of the, of the screen yeah. and not really blocking anything or hiding anything. It was all relevant information. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I guess what I'm, and I, a lot of people in the uh, in the chat are referencing this as well, kind of going back to the Brood War days where you actually don't know what is coming out of the gateways or the, the hatcheries, etc. So when 12 Ultras pop out of nowhere, it's like, <laughs> it's that excitement level of like, oh my god, 12 Ultras <laughs> just popped on the map and no one knew it was coming. Which, I, I guess the only solution or the only way to see if it would make like a big impact is to go back and do a tournament without all of that information or do like a cast without all that information but then you just get constantly whined at in the chat so yeah. i don't know how it would work <laughs> can you imagine if you turned the production tab off for an entire game i got oh yeah i got yeah. a tweet saying that i turned the production tab off today for like two minutes at the start of a game. I'm like, it's basic openers, guys. Chill out. Oh my god. Both players are building workers. Yeah. <laughs> and then supplies. It's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> someone just does like a one off cast or something where there's like none of that going on. Like, maybe do like the. Because the. So a great example of this would actually be the tech swaps of Lenok. Like, if we didn't know those were coming. And then, like, all of a sudden, like, 30 mutas just popped up out of nowhere. Like, that would be fucking insane. But now it's just, like, the excitement level comes from, oh, there's 36 mutas in the production tab. Like, that's going to be insane. So, mm. I don't know. I, I don't know how to actually test that, and I don't think anyone will ever actually test that. So, we're probably yeah. stuck with, uh, with what we have now. Well, so. if you want to test that, you can watch Pro League, where they always put the units counts instead of the... Production number and uh, it make, it drives me crazy. Oh really? They don't do production yeah. at all? Oh god! No, they do sometimes, but like, I don't think the guy likes it too much because he's always on uh, unit counts when I watch, and it it seriously drives me crazy. I'm really mad. I'm about to send some hate emails or something <laughs> like have an epileptic seizure. I don't know. I'm like screaming, put the fucking production tab on, please. I'm begging you. Like, mm. You know, and, and maybe maybe this is the. At a BC, you're watching. Maybe this is the next level of observing is keeping that information from people until right before it happens. Maybe that's That'd the next cool. level of observing. How, how would you notice that it was happening? I don't know, QXG. I don't answer these <laughs> questions. <laughs> I just pose them, all right? You would have to, you would have to be <laughs> wow. observing with two computers. Yeah. So we need, like, we need a casting or a observing archon. That's what we need. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we have a an assistant observer, like an apprentice. We had that at MLG, actually. When we uh, when they would set up two PCs, we would have one for the picture-in-picture, -picture, and then, right. like, uh, Addy BC would be the uh, the main observer, and then, like, the two of them would communicate and obviously, like, all right, take the screen and then take it off. They're the ones making those calls. So maybe that's the next level. Maybe that's the next level. But then also, it would just turn into people trolling as observers, so that's all it would be. <laughs> I also want to just quickly mention for Gameheart, like the the way in which that they uh, have like, and they do it in some of the WCS uh, overlay. No, maybe they don't. Anyway, they have all the scores and everything at the bottom of the screen, basically. And technically, the, there was a screenshot that showed how much uh, space that you actually have, observable space on the screen. And if you have all of that at the very bottom, then you have a great amount of space up at the top. Uh, and that makes it better for observing. I hmm. I really hope people keep doing that because yeah, as much screen space as possible is always really good. 
So I hope we can work that into the WCS overlays eventually. All right. Well, that was DreamHack. Awesome event all around. Uh, I don't think there were any glaring issues that occurred. Um, huge shout out to NASL as well for doing their cast of the games. Um, I think I thought they did an awesome job. The production there was great. Uh, it was awesome to see Clutch kind of doing the quote unquote sideline reporting where it was just feeding information to the two casters the entire time. I don't think any other tournaments are actually doing that yet. Um, and it that's kind of how it works in professional broadcasting where you have people just slipping you stats the entire time. So that was cool. Um, all, in, all in all, awesome dream hat. Can't wait for the next. So let's move on and talk about Total Biscuits Tournament, a.k.a. Well, I, I don't know if it's a.k.a. yet. I'll pose this question to you guys. Shoutcraft America, is this what WCS should have been in North America? And we'll start with QXE. Uh, I don't know. You don't know. QXE, man. I'm like I don't, I don't even have, like... Who's this? I'm sorry. <laughs> all right hold on hold on Give all right <laughs> you want to repose so, the question it's also genesis tournament what, sorry Chad. what wcs na should have been yes i don't think i don't really like the idea of big fish small pond kind of thing i feel like it it reduces the value of your victories and your wins when you know you're beating not the best players that could have competed or the best players around um and so I'm I'm okay with the way WCS North America is. Like if I'm actually not good enough to qualify in it right now, then I need to get better. Um, I don't need a free invite. Like it it just doesn't. Like yeah, it's nice to be part of events and to play in them. But if you're really not good enough to play in them, like there's no point. I would get. I I don't know if I'm good enough right now. I've been playing much better recently. I've been doing quite well. But I don't like the idea of being invited into an event and then immediately going out in the first two rounds. Like, mm. What I like a lot about WCS North America right now and WCS everything is it's hopefully going to be more consistent practice against higher caliber players, especially in a region that has so many players and so many people but just not very many events and not very many like repeatable opportunities. There's just a lot more tournaments. There's a lot more activity in Europe um, to help promote that scene and help feed it and things like that. And so anything that's happening in North America is good for me. So there's your answer, whatever you can glean from it. There's my answer. Uh, how, what, what did you think of the... Uh, how the invites worked for this tournament. Because obviously you said you were grinding ladder uh, for like a week and a half or two weeks or something like that. Did you enjoy yeah, that process? Yeah, so kind of. I mean, so basically I don't usually play NA ladder. I just generally, like I, there are a number of very good players on North America, but there are much fewer good players on North America than there are, are in Europe and Korea. Like the, the skill density is what bothers me the most is I can go from playing against Beyond Prime, who happens to be like owning everyone on NA for a couple hours for whatever reason, and then play against people who are like barely high masters or like very low GM. And they're just, it's just not a challenge. It's not interesting. Uh, and that happens much less frequently on the other server. So in general, I don't, I don't even play NA. And then I thought with the WCS North America, they like there was some rumor that they might use ladder to consider players, so I played on NA and I played like a hundred games in a couple of days and got like top ten GM and then I was like oh, I guess that's not how it works. So then I stopped playing, <laughs> and then I got removed from GM, and then like two days later, I I see the tweet about Shoutcraft and I'm like oh cool now I have to re-enter GM, and like whenever you re-enter GM it puts you at like rank 190. Uh pretty much like regardless of where you were before. So I went from like rank 10 to like remove from GM to rank 190 and then I like had to get back up. I don't know. It was like it was fun because I like winning and I was winning a lot. <laughs> and it was like competitive and it was like enjoyable because I was winning at like being the top <clears throat> North American player, but just in terms of overall execution, players should have gotten much more warning, mm. and I would have preferred to see it open to everyone from all regions. 
How many games were you playing each day, would you say? Um, probably like eight or nine hours worth. Some of my games are pretty fast. I mean, it depends who I play. Like, when I play Fitzy, the games tend to be a little bit longer. But uh, isn't the theme of the tournament to find out who the best in America is? Yeah. Yeah, I don't really care about the theme. I think it's a dumb theme. Like, <laughs> well, who's the best player in a bad region? Like, it, it doesn't even interest me at all. <laughs> what, what, what does interest me and what I really liked about the competition, the way people were selected, is it forced the North American ladder to be way more active. And so, like, it, the skill density all of a sudden increased dramatically because all sorts of top American players, South American, whatever, were... Is it open to South Americans? Yeah, I think it yeah, is. Yeah, it is. We're, we're competing on the ladder and playing much more actively than they would have otherwise. And that's why I said I would really like to see it open to all regions because, like, maybe his intent is to find out who the best American player is. Great, that's fine. What I think is really cool is to get more people to play ladder on the same server to increase the overall competitiveness and just increase the practice environment uh, for everyone, really, because there's, well, obviously Europeans, Koreans, Southeast Asia, they all have latency to North America. It is the best, the best common ground. Like Europe to Korea is said to be almost unplayable, and so at least everyone can play and can participate if they so choose. It would be really cool to log on the North American server and see Lenok and Naniwa laddering there. I think that would be awesome. It's a very fair point that uh, I, I don't think has been raised, that it did... Like, have you played after the fact now that it's no longer a factor in this <laughs> tournament? Is it is it back to normal? Not really. I went See, back to so I guess that's speaking for what what I'm asking for. Like, no one's playing on the NA server now that it's not worth anything, right? Well, there's still, like, the NA server is nice it's when I get frustrated with playing with 260 millisecond delay, hmm. which is about what I have when I play in Korea. Um, Europe doesn't really frustrate me very much because the delay is about the same, but there's a lot of people who just they just play North America because they don't like latency or whatever, but most top North American gamers, I think, play on Korea, at least to some extent. The other thing that, that bothers me about this... Okay, so JP, let's say that the primary intent of this tournament is to find out who the best American player is. Sure. Why would you only give people a week and then have GM be locked so players like Huck, Scarlet, and Major don't even have an opportunity to participate? Mm, it was late in the planning, I think, when I right, spoke to John. Like, but... I don't know. It's, it's yeah, just think... like, the, if, if that that's is the stated yeah. intent, that's not what the tournament is going to be. <clears throat> it's going to be... I think it would have been cool to have uh, lots of the best Americans play each other to figure out yeah. who the best American is with, like, Idra in there... Um, we already have you, Minigun, Pug, Vibe, uh, Suppy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I really wanted to see you guys compete against each other, but now it's just like the top 16 of the ladder at the time. And a lot of, lot of the names in there, there is some that I don't know. Yeah. That uh, as a player who's not part of the North American scene, I'm not particularly going to be wanting to watch because I don't know them. So... If don't you think there should have been some invites, or do you think it's okay that it's uh, USA plus Canada, Mexico? It's just North uh, America. Like, yeah, well, it's it, best preference. Isn't North isn't it North America plus Central and South America, right? I guess it's it's America. That's why it's called Shotcraft America. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but first, when I first read about the tournament, I thought it it would only be USA. Mm. So I didn't think like uh, Mexico or Canada would be included, and I thought that was pretty interesting. <clears throat> In my head, what came was Idra playing versus QXE and etc. Uh, Suppy, Vibe, and Puck, Minigun, all these guys playing a tournament together to figure out who the best in the USA is, and it sounded pretty good because uh, we d we haven't had uh, any regional qualifiers for like an international tournament like WCG or something in a while. So it's a pretty good question, who the best in the USA is. Uh, and I thought, I did think that this was a 
going to be that. But now I realize that, well, it's three countries uh, at least, and it was just the top 16 of the region. So don't, do you think that this, uh, the way it was done is worse than the, the idea that I had initially? or I, I like the idea of a tournament that you only qualify for. Because it gives it gives more opportunities to people who are playing well now, as opposed to people who used to play well or who people think can play well but haven't haven't like they haven't proven themselves recently, and that's that's what allows people like State or I, I mean Hello Kitty and Maker both got invited to WCS uh, America, but right. Like neither of those players really have a, a ton of results. If you were thinking like, let me invite the top sixteen North American, they aren't the first people that would jump to their to your mind, but they were able to get the points. It's not like other players weren't trying for it. Like there were some people who were locked out. I know Illusion didn't have an account in GM, I don't think Scarlet or Major did, but like Idra was competing for this. And he didn't make it? Competing. No, he didn't. Trimaster was playing for it. Like there were a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, I thought he played a lot. He does play a lot, mm. and I don't know what happened, but like, it's it's not like some of the people that you were mentioning, or that you think like should be top sixteen. It's not like all of them weren't going for it. Almost almost everyone was, and that's how it went down. I guess I don't know. I I think that what a lot of people it's not maybe misunderstanding, but. The fact that it was like announced ten days before the ladder closed was kind of seizing the moment and the opportunity for being able to do a tournament like this that I think Jenna mm -hmm. really wanted to focus on. Right. But I mean, they can do this at the end of every ladder season. And actually, I mean, what if they make it like you said? They they do three regions. They do a region or a tournament for every region and make the ladder important again, rather than yeah. just being a number that means nothing. Like that to me. Is and I think that the the way that they cover that as well. So like maybe a, a weekly check in or or something like that. Like there's definitely things that you can do to make that hype level there. But the yeah. fact that it was ten days prior before it was closing, like that sucks. That like yeah, I mean what bottom line is that sucks. But some of the other players that I was talking to you about it, our kind of general feel was this was really. It's a good idea, but it was rushed out partly in response to what happened with the WCS American Premier Qualifiers, which, you know, things just didn't go well in general. There were a lot of mistakes being made, a lot of people excluded. The qualifiers ended up being dominated by Koreans, which a lot of people weren't happy with. And so that's it's like going back to your first question is like is this what WCS North America should have been well maybe in a lot of people's eyes yes and so that's why we kind of see it all of a sudden right now let's do this thing mm. I regardless though I, I if this moves forward like and I'm I'm there's no question in my mind that this is going to do incredibly well you have Husky and Total Biscuit casting it they have probably bigger audiences or comparable audiences to Tastosis from like the casual scene like it's going to get great numbers. It's going to have probably incredible numbers. So with that in mind, like, and with the tip jar and how all that works, if they do another one of these, I can guarantee you that Jenna and Total Biscuit are going to like blow this one out of the water. And I, I, I think Todd, that was you messaging in the uh, in the chat that uh, European players are wanting something like this for their own scenes. So I could see this easily expanding, or maybe he just goes to the European scene and then the Korean scene, etc. So. Um, I, I definitely think it is, and we had Total Biscuit on the show last week, so if, if you missed that, you can go watch it, uh, for those wondering, uh, a lot of the questions that maybe I'm not rephrasing properly, but I, I think regardless, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, the groups were actually drawn today, QXZ, you're in group yeah, D, group. What, what do you think about your group? Um, I don't, I'm, I'm a little confused about my group because I didn't expect the RSVP uh, to be top 16. He was he used to be on Complexity actually a while ago. And then well, he you have the easiest group, just say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make it out of my group. But I don't know. I, I haven't, like most of the people who made top 16 I played on the ladder mm. while I was, you know, 
because we were all like pretty active on the ladder, and right. I didn't really play any. I mean, I plays, I barely played Xenocider on the ladder. We played like practice games with each other, but the other two, I don't remember the last time I played them. Stayed in RSVP. Yeah, so I don't, I, I don't know what to expect. I mean, we haven't seen. I think the last time I saw RSVP was like for an Alienware tournament. Um, for those tournaments that they do. So it's been a long time since I've seen him. And because, obviously, they didn't have an open bracket, I'm sure he would have played in that as well at MLG. Um, but I think that that in itself is already kind of proving that it's giving players who actually, like you said, are either good at that time or grind for it and, and show that they are actually trying. Um, and they're getting a shot at it right now. Like, this will probably get him some fans from this tournament. It'll definitely get him some notoriety. So... Uh, that that's pretty awesome. What what about some of the other groups? QXC. Who who would you think is like your biggest competition? Mm, probably Masa or um, I need to look at the groups again. I have a lot of respect for Masa. He's always we've played in a number of times, a number of different events over the last couple of months, and he's he's probably seventy thirty against me and. Like tournaments, but I have been beating him more recently. Mm -hmm. Kane, Hendrilis, Ghost of User, Suppy, and Puck. I think are and possibly Xenocider. Xeno's a lot better than than people think. He doesn't have a lot of tournament results, but he's a very solid player. Like a lot of players you you play against and you're like, wow. Like, maybe you beat him, maybe you didn't, but his strategy was not very good, or it was not executed very well. Like, when I play against Xenocider, I'm always really impressed. Like, his timings are really crisp. He's a very aggressive player. He's obviously put a lot of thought into his play. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it it's a tournament. Anything can happen, right? <laughs> it's very, very true. Kolaris and Todd, uh, I was kind of singling out QXC here since he is involved in it. What, what do you guys think about this? We'll start with Kolaris. Um, for me, Shoutcraft America, you asked at the beginning, like, is this what WCS NA should have been? Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually have to just go with a resounding yes. I, I really do wish this is how WCS America had been. Uh, one part, because uh, Blizzard, Blizzard is wanting to build stories, right, with WCS, that's one of their big, big goals, and I'm pretty sure Cloaken mentioned that last uh, week on, on State of the Game. Uh, and for me, the only story that's coming out of WCS NA right now is how... <laughs> it's a video on YouTube, the 8 best American. Oh my god, that yes. video is so funny. Exactly. <laughs> There's nothing else apart from Oh great! It's WCSNA time. Time to watch Koreans smash some Europe uh, Americans, and it's <laughs> and it's it's gonna be there'll be one player who beats some Americans and goes through to the round of 16, Scarlet or somebody like that. And it's like, yay! We'll see if Scarlet's able to take out 15 other Koreans, guys. I think I I'm kind of I'm not I'm not I'm not a fan of that. I mean, if I had to sacrifice our four Koreans in WCS EU to have just a pure region lock, then yeah, I'd do it. So we could have NA just be the best NA players, all of the best NA players, finding out who is the best from NA, and then going to the season final to see if, if the best from NA can beat the best from Korea. Not have that happen during WCS NA. Thanks. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> a short rant. Todd. <laughs> Your thoughts? The video. <laughs> the video is too good. I had <laughs> to show this it. One? Captain America. Who no, dude, the best one is the fucking Crank Eagle or Eagle Crank. Like, it's the best one. Uh, the a live statue of liberty is pretty sick. That's pretty good. Oh, you mean you mean heart? Isn't it live? I think. I mean, <laughs> we don't even so know. Good. Can't even recognize them. Man. Oh yeah, it's heart. Okay. It uh, uh, it's awesome. Regardless, this video has been played a billion times, but it's so good. Okay, back to Shoutcraft. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. There is a couple of good players in there, but I personally, yeah, I can't get over the fact that Idra is not in there. I really wanted to see Idra compete versus other American players and see how he does. Um, I, I think what you're saying, Todd, is you want to see Idra compete against other Americans and see how bad he rages. Is that what no, you're saying? <laughs> not particularly. I just want to okay. see how he does. Like, I want to see who. I want to know who's the best American player, but when I say American, I mean from USA. 
like it's a pretty interesting question for me because I do think that USA now has some pretty good players. Uh, Puck, Vibe, Minigun, Suppy, QXC, Idra, all these guys, Gozu user, they can beat each other. Uh -huh. And I will find it very interesting to see a tournament with these guys playing each other. So I was a little dis disappointed that Sharkcraft wasn't that tournament. But looking at the groups, group stages here, um, we, do, uh, we do have a lot of these players. And once, once this gets to the quarterfinals or semifinals, I do think we are going to have a couple of good matches that I might take a look at. Um, personally, I usually focus pretty much uh, on only Protoss. But now that I've started casting, I do watch more Zerg and Terran and QXC. I will be following you, uh, most likely. Don't disappoint <laughs> me. The pressure's on. I think it's a good initiative. It's better to have a tournament like this, which some people are not... Well, not everybody can be happy. So even though some people might not be too happy about it, like, and when I say not too happy, it's like, I mean that it's not the perfect tournament that we would have liked. I do think it's a very good initiative uh, from Total Biscuit uh, and his wife to throw uh, a tournament like this uh, with a good prize pool to motivate the players. Like UXC said, they've been laddering pretty hard for this. Uh, it's it's very good for the community. And did they say that they were going to continue after this? Because I would love to see all regions be like this. Because right now, sure. to me, the ladder is up unless well, as a caster you go. This guy's currently ranked twenty on the grandmaster ladder, guys. He's pretty darn good. Other than that, what's the ladder useful for if you don't have tournaments like this? Yeah. Other than I mean, proving, it's, it's a. It's a decent way to practice and it gives you a wide variety of pr opponents that you can't really get oh, yeah I I'm just, not, I'm, I, 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 I sorry I like I, your idea I, that the ladder should have more meaning that people should like sometimes you go on ladder and people just kind of like ditz around but it's nice to go on ladder and know that there's something greater at stake besides yeah. just the points in this one game yeah, that's more what I was referring to. Because, of course, you know, it is there and it's useful to ladder on. But you're rank one on Grandmaster Ladder. That's fantastic. What does that mean? It, it, it doesn't lead on to anything more, whereas it should do, I think. Yeah. And, and to answer your question, I, I would assume that they're going to just keep doing this if it does well. Because, I mean, I hope so. Jenna and TB are not dumb in that way. Like, they're going to keep doing it if it does well. And uh, this is probably only the beginning. Um, they are probably responsible for the most innovation we've seen in kind of the tournament um, scene, or I guess the, I don't know, how to, not fun tournament, but just like doing new things or bringing new things to the table. Like the tip jar is probably the, the one thing you can single out with that. Like that is just genius. They've also been like huge uh, promoters of getting um, like the team, jer the virtual team jerseys in there, and promoting other team sponsors and whatnot. So, I, I think we're only going to see more awesome things like that coming from um, Jenna and TB and, and Shoutcraft America. So, that's a uh, that's a good bookmark for here, I, I think. Unless, does anyone else have anything to add before we move on? Perfect. Okay, uh, QXC. I will ask. It's been an hour. Are, are, you, are you able to stay on for another twenty, thirty minutes? Uh, ish. What? Uh, eh. Kind of. I mean, like, I kind of need to go and like do stuff. Eh. What? Uh, I'll, I'll stay on a little bit longer. There you go. Now we get it, to see if you're going to be worthwhile. Did you watch Group B last night? I watched uh, the games where Terran won. Yes. All right. And, well, we'll... the series, the series that Terran won. Okay. We will. Which, uh, let's jump yeah. to WCS Korea then. Um. Group B, uh, it was, I think, probably the most hyped group uh, in all of GSL, the most stacked group in all of GSL. Uh, it, it was definitely awesome to watch, and we'll just kind of start with that. QXC, what did you think about the Terran matches? Mm, do you want to start with... Uh, well, we'll start okay. with wherever you want, man. <sighs> okay. So I thought it was interesting because... Uh, Flash versus Innovation, the last time they met at MLG, Innovation did lose. And I think what it, what it felt like to me was Flash was still playing the tournament as if it was a big bracket where he didn't know he, who he would go up against, and Innovation was specifically preparing to go against Flash. 
And the reason I say that is if you if you pay close attention or paid close attention to the last MLG, most of the people who went far in that tournament were only doing one or two builds. The entire tournament, no matter who they played against, they were usually only switching between one or two openings with slight variations. Which is kind of what we saw Flash do when he played against Innovation, is he opened one Rex Expand into Hellbat Drop every single game. Which is a pretty good strategy when you don't know who you're going to go up against. Like, if you have to play possibly six or seven people in a row in the same day, you can't prepare for each one. Innovation used a different build in every single game that he played. And I can kind of assume that they were specifically tailored to kind of deal with what he thought Flash would do. Either way, it was three different builds. It takes a lot more preparation to be confident to do multiple different builds. And so it was, it was kind of confusing to watch Flash repeatedly open in the exact same way. And then... Like, theoretically, if you play perfectly, you're like, I know how to react to everything using my one build, so I don't need other builds. But there's a certain amount of, like, part of the game is mental. So if you don't expect something, you're going to react slower to it. At the same time, if you do expect something or you're familiar with something, you're always going to react faster to it. And so it's like, it's like Flash was basically giving Innovation that mental edge. Because every time Innovation scouted him, he could be like, oh, this looks like the same thing and uh do you guys do you guys want to i mean i could just keep talking about things if you want i i'm i'm down with that unless i mean kalaris right. and todd feel free to jump so in whenever game number two between flash and innovation was one of the silliest games that i had seen in a while it was basically one racks expand against two racks reaper and it just looked like Flash wasn't ready for it. He was like, that was like the thirty-second game, right? Yeah, it was like <laughs> just one with three it was reapers. Just yeah. about five minutes. Yeah. Whereas, like, the first Marine died to a Reaper, I think, and then the he had four Marines, and two of them were at the natural, and two of them were at the main, and like ex hoping, like, okay, I hope my opponent doesn't make more than two Reapers, and then Innovation went two racks Reaper, where you always go up to four. And then he just killed all his Marines and the game ended. And it was like, <laughs> right. well, maybe if you scout your opponent going Reaper, you should build your command center in your main so that you don't have two places to defend. And then you just, you know, chill out until you actually have units. It, it just like, when I think of Flash, I think of like an unstoppable calculating killing machine where he knows what to do in every situation. And I really didn't see that from him in that series. It was like, it was like he miscalculated, and I didn't think that was possible. Innovation's taken that mantle, man. He is, he is the Terminator. He's crazy. Yeah, he's a boss. Mm -hmm. His games against Life were so sick. He was like, hey, look, yeah. all I need oh my God. Mines are Marines. And Life was like... Oh, man. Those matches were actually... There, there was that one Wid Widow Mine, I think it was on Daybreak? Where like in the very center of the map where like two widow mines went off and I think like eighty lings died oh. or some crazy yeah, amount. It, oh my god. Like innovation does a really good job of spreading his widow mines out. So yeah. like like over the screen, if he has ten, ten widow mines, none of them will be within like three or four hexes of each other. And so he did that, and then after a battle, it was like life just forgot there were widow mines. And like like six of them went off. He lost like all of his infestors. Like his broodlord started. I wish I had there. the like, of that. What the hell? Like I can understand. You know, there's a big fight. Like it's very chaotic. Maybe you think like there's one widow mine left. Like I'm not gonna worry about it. But like, wouldn't you still? Why didn't he build an overseer? I don't. I don't understand, man. Yeah. Just like it, one it, overseer with his I, army. You, wasn't like, innovation sniping up. the uh, the overseers with his Vikings? I remember him doing that a couple times at least. Um, I don't think he had Vikings at that. Boy, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know. I'd actually, but, I don't remember either. So yeah, innovation just really, really strong. I think it's kind of interesting that he, he against Flash he did a different build every game, and then against Life he opened CC first Barracks Gas both games, but he did like a slight variation. In one game he went six Hellions and then transitioned into like Marine Medevac really quickly with Widow Mines, and the other game he went like nine or ten hellions mm. and he hid 
Like, he only showed six, so he made it look like it was the same build. And it almost was the same build. And then he's like, surprise, ten Hellions. <laughs> and that was, like, the big difference. Dude, innovation's amazing. He's like the Unsullied from Game of Thrones. He just has mm. no emotions, blank face in game. He goes along and spears all his masters down, <laughs> flash his master of Terran. He's like, no, thank you, bye. Life, he goes down as well. He's, oh my god. He had He's a big smile on his face when he beat Life. Okay, yeah. maybe he does have emotions. And you could see, because, <laughs> right, like this group was parting pick Life, Life pick Innovation, Innovation pick Flash, right? Yes. I'm going to pretend that's yeah. what it was. I think that's and the so order. It, like, Innovation's like, oh, Life picked me because he thinks he can beat me. And then he smashes him 2 0, yeah. and, like, he knows he's won, and he starts dropping mules on him, and then yeah. the game ends, and he's got a smile. He's like, well. Pretty good. I think, I'm gonna, I think I'll just leave now because I advanced. Uh, good luck, guys. <laughs> so we, we are kind of... I just want to throw this out there since we are a little bit of a circle joke right now on innovation. What, life's lings. Like, what? I don't understand how he can get so much out of his lings compared to everyone else. Like, so the How basic, is that possible? <laughs> the basic... Um, there's like basically two fundamental concepts that life exploits much more than other people. One is that lings are faster than hellions. So you sh you, when you're engaging a big group of hellions, you always try and run past them, and then once the hellions are surrounded, your lings will always be cost efficient. And so what life will often do is he'll, he'll have to sacrifice 10 or 15 or 20 or even 30% of his lings to get that surround. Once you get the surround, the hellions are dead, and then you have total map control. And you see him do that quite a bit. The other thing that he does is against Hellions, as long as they're not blue flame, and even when they are blue flame but to a lesser extent, as long as you're on creep, your ling should always be cost efficient. Hmm. Because basically, you should never allow the Hellions to like get in some like stupid corner where they have really low surface area, and so the lings can't really engage, because the lings are not just faster than Hellions, but like a fucking huge amount faster than Hellions. <laughs> the moment they come on creep, you should be able to get a, like an instant full surround. And so he's able to drone harder than most players and play safer and still be like just as safe against those Hellions without really worrying about spine crawlers as much or roaches or banelings and things like that. Um... Yeah, I think that's pretty much what he does. It's not even <laughs> just against Terran, though. It's also against yeah. Protoss. Like, yeah, he, the lane against... run buys against Parting were insane, which I, I guess is what you're referencing. Actually, there was those, but there was also a point on, I think it was Belshia Vestige, where there's this army waddling towards his third base, and he has two Colossi as well as you know quite a good amount of force fields there, and it just comes in from every angle and overwhelms this entire army with just lings. There was a few queens there, admittedly, to help out as well, but mm. most people just do not execute that anywhere near as well as he does. He, he just centers on this one point and comes in from every single angle. It's, it's insane. Todd, let's talk a little bit about parting. Um, we'll start off, let's just kind of go down his matches. His, his opening match against life, what did you think about that? Uh, that was very disappointing. I didn't really understand what he was trying to achieve. He saw that his opponent was going for mass links, and he went for Colossus, and then blink stalkers, and like he made lots of blink stalkers. I couldn't understand the whole time what exactly he was doing, but um, well, he ended up losing O2 spoilers, and <laughs> Sorry, he was never in control. Say spoilers. <laughs> he was never in control of the games. Just. I couldn't understand what he was doing. And just now, like a couple of minutes before we started the show, I read this interview uh, after qualifying. And he basically, he explained that usually life is this guy who's super aggressive and always tries to mix in some all-ins. And he does not very often go for the standard macro solid style. He will always try to keep his opponent guessing and stuff like that. And that's what Spartan was was expecting. Because of that, he wanted to go for an aggressive style which was safest against everything. So if he got Colossus and lots of Blink Stalkers, it would work against almost everything, except maybe the only one thing that life was doing now, which was solid, macro. And even though Parting saw the way uh, life opened and was scouting in mid-game, he kept 
on thinking that there was something hidden that was going to happen later on. Basically, life was disguising some sneaky timing or all-in with uh, some standard play. Uh, sadly for him, it never came, and he lost this series pretty hard, and I was a very sad panda uh, for the beginning of this group. All right. Well, now let's talk, and QXC, you can jump in on this as well. Parting versus Flash. I felt like game one, everyone... Everyone, the casters, everyone, no one thought that Parting was going to come back against Flash. Like, Parting played, is it, is it safe to say that that was probably one of the best showings from Parting that we've seen in the second yeah, half think, of that game? I think so, yeah. It was just fucking ridiculous. If you ask me, uh, his Templars all over the map, there is, I think he's the only Protoss who could have won that uh, the way he did. The, what he does with the Templars staying out of range of the scans, and then always coming from every angle is so hard to do. Like, seriously, I, I've tried it, and I just lose <laughs> all my fucking Templars and like storm. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, yeah, that was super impressive. And behind this, Flash looked a little bit strange. He went for battle cruisers when there yeah, is Tempest in weird. the game, and like everybody uh, already on Twitter was like, "Well, I guess he's going battle cruisers versus Tempest. It's not going to be pretty." And it wasn't pretty, and uh, he lost this very hard. Um, so I do think that this game parting should not have been able to win on daybreak in split map situation is so hard for Sister and they get lots of ghosts and then they can't really lose anymore. Yeah, Protoss might have the ultimate uh, late game now with Tempest, um, but yeah. Flash is, was not supposed to let it get to that in this game and going forward Cruises was a huge mistake. QXC, but you're yeah, parting. trying to jump in there. Oh, I just think BC Raven beats Tempest with Raven. <laughs> No, point defense drone is so good against Tempest. They are at the. Why are you laughing? Todd, it's just like uh, fucking American. You see, Raven is sick. Point defense drone. You put down like. Okay, Tempest have have. I'm gonna I'm gonna liquipedia this, so I'm absolutely precise here. Tempest have a weapon speed of. 3. I remember a blog by QXC. Tempest have no place in this game or something like that. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> I do remember that. I don't like the Tempest, but that doesn't mean I don't think you could beat it. 3.3 weapon speed. You know how slow that is? You know what the weapon speed of a Stalker is? 1.44. A Tempest attacks t more than two times as slowly as a Stalker and is three times the amount of supply. And you want to break point defense drone with that? So you're how saying Ravens and Battle Cruisers beat Tempest? Yes. Okay, why don't you go try it versus parting and see what happens? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think I, I don't think I'd be able to get there. Oh, God. <laughs> it, you know, we were actually joking about this last night. I'm so glad that there wasn't a post or a uh, gathering of people saying like, Oh, my God, guys, we're seeing Battle Cruisers and Tempest in this game. It's the best game ever. Like, I'm so glad uh, that that <laughs> shit did not happen again. And that people are actually recognizing like, it was an amazing game because of how Parting like clawed his way back to win against that. And what what was like the pivotal moment? Because to me, the the moment that sticks in my uh, mind, Todd, was when uh, on Daybreak, the middle of the map where you have those rocks, where like all of his medevacs and all the units basically clumped, and there were two storms right on top of it. Do you remember that moment? Was that yeah, kind yeah, of the yeah. moment where Parting was just like, "I fucking done it." Yeah. I fucking outplayed you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Played the probably to himself. Uh, the Templars coming from every side pin uh, flash down into a small area, and he was never able to get the good scans to be able to see all the Templars get the snipe and the EMPs. And then ultimately, he was stuck in a fucking corner. Parting came in there, stormed all this shit, and Flash couldn't even really evacuate at this point. He he was hesitating between picking up and trying to leave and staying. He stayed for the most part, but then he left with like. Most of his medivacs on very low hit points, he had lost his entire army. And then from there, going into the transition for battle cruisers, Ravens or not, I'm sorry, QXC, he's fucking suicide. So he, <laughs> he, just, he just couldn't win from there. It was already decided. Todd, 1v1 me. <laughs> I can oh, show you god. Battle Cruiser Raven. You can go Tempest all you want. All right, guys. Here's what we do. <laughs> oh my god. Let's contact GSL, get the replay, and then we'll resume from replay. We don't even need to resume from replay. We can just build two fucking awesome yeah. armies. We but should I think, do that. like in theory, maybe this could work. But the thing is, you would never have enough gas to make uh, as many Ravens and Battle Cruisers as you want. 
Otherwise, your support will be like full Marines, and I don't think that's very good. Don't you, you agree? You think that? Except I've done this. <laughs> Is this on NA ladder or? Uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh god all right you you two can have the show match that you actually should do that show match and each stream it you'll get some good numbers i promise you every you game must it. go to tempest battle cruiser yeah you or should rather... do that uh in shotcraft <laughs> no why, why don't you do that in shotcraft when when state and rsvp shit on you i'm gonna be laughing <laughs> Todd, the rematch, parting versus life. Let's just move there before this turns into something it shouldn't be. <laughs> I think that was sick. That was even sicker than Flash versus Parting, I think. Yeah? Such a good display by um, by Parting. Like, uh, my mind was blown during this series. It's not very often that I see a match and I think, wow, you know what? This guy actually played really fucking good. But that was one of those matches. I felt like to step away from the actual games for a second. When the camera went on parting after he won, if he would have lost that, like, his ego and everything, his world would have just been, like, he would have been so depressed. But the fact that he yeah. won and the emotion that we saw, like, he wasn't even looking at the camera. And for someone that has, yeah. like, such an ego, like, he's shown recently, like, he was in tears because of this win. He was, like, and trying to dry his eyes out. Too. Like, it, Do life what? Life was so big. Oh yeah, life, life was just staring at the computer. Like that was even more of a emotional scene where he just he didn't even have like an emotion on his face. He was just like, I can't believe I just got eliminated. Like I can't believe that just happened. It we'll never see another group like this, probably because GSL is gonna go talk to all these people and be like, Look, don't fucking screw us again. Like, oh why? It was the best thing to ever happen. Did you see this how the studio was filled? Yeah, Every that's very true. Basement. But but would it have not been better if this was the round of four? No. It would have not been better? Uh, Wait, mine wouldn't it? Yeah, maybe, no. but, maybe, but I think this was awesome. Seriously, after I saw this, I was like, okay, next time cool. I play a tournament, I don't give a fuck. First interview I'm doing, <laughs> I'm going to stay. I'm going to stomp these kids all the way. And it's, I think it's great for the community. Did you see how many people there was in the studio? That's yeah, it was, def it, was, it was more packed than it was for the first WCS like the announcement after that, there was more people in the studio than there were for the first CODES day of the official WCS tournament. So like... This, this probably even got some people who weren't particularly interested in the games or probably never watched the games yeah. interested in. Imagine, like even I, I went to people who don't particularly watch StarCraft and I was like, oh wow, man, you gotta watch these games. So this guy has been talking mad shit. He picked this one guy to be in his group. The other guy said his skill doesn't even reach his feet. <laughs> and they're going to be playing later and yeah that was just sick I really love that and uh, if you see me in a tournament later on and uh, I have to do some interviews you're going to be surprised <laughs> I fully want this Todd man so I what, want more shit talking so what Todd Starcraft. is saying is that finally someone from the Korean scene became an entertainer as well as a player and like that's what we actually saw from parting was him like yes. hyping the matches up yeah. and then he delivered which I'm sure he gained a billion fans from this, both in Korea and uh, internationally. And now but him and Innovation about, are going to be moving forward. But Todd, go ahead. Yeah, think about this, the boxing matches. Oh, exactly. How do they have boxing matches? Yeah, the UFC, is, it's all promotion. That's why those things are so exciting. It's because they uh, do like, the, the weigh-ins and everything. Yeah, in the UFC, there's actually lots of modest fighters who are going to say, like, well, this is going to be a hard match and stuff. I need sure. to do this and that. But in boxing... Almost every single time you have a match, people are gonna well, be like, "I'm, I, I'm gonna knock this motherfucker out." That's what I'm going. That's what I'm gonna do, and right. that creates some huge hype. Everybody wants to see the fight, even if the fight is shitty. Somebody's gonna win, and they talked shit before. So, ultimately, no matter what the result is, you're always gonna wanna watch, see who right. wins, see who got who got his mouth shut from that fight, and that's what happened here too. And people loved it. And so I think we should have more yeah, of this. Perfect example of that is uh, for UFC fans out there. This past weekend, Chael Sonnen versus, um, oh my God, I'm fucking forgetting his name, and I'm like the biggest UFC fan. Regardless, he had no chance in that fight. But the John fight, Jones? yeah, John Jones. Thank you. Like he had no chance versus John Jones. Uh, that's ar obviously arguable, but like, 
The reason that match was so awesome is because Chael Sonnen's probably one of the best promoters in UFC, and that's why it was fucking awesome, because they went out, they promoted this, and then after yes. every fight, like, you can see them, like, they're friends. They're not going over and be like, fuck you, I can't believe you won, or et cetera, et cetera. Like, they're friendly about it. So hopefully it's kind of a clue in for some of the bigger pros out there to actually, like, be okay with doing this. Yeah. It's not that you well, go up to sure. someone and be like, you fucking suck. It's like, I'm going to beat you. Like, there's different ways to promote yeah. it, you know? Yeah. I'm not sure that he was friend with Anderson Silva when he dissed him. Well, and, yeah. It, it's, always, it's always speculation, but... I'm sure at, yeah. at the end of the day, they'll probably go have a drink one day together <laughs> and be friendly, but we'll never know. We'll never know. The winner, will, do what? the winner will be like, uh, I really crushed you, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Remember that time I fucking destroyed you? Yeah. Um, but yeah, Group B, probably the most hyped group, and it delivered, I think, through and through. K Kolaris, you, I guess we haven't really had your thoughts too much on it, but do you agree? I agree. There you go. There you go. Now, who wins it? Is Innovation imparting a shoe in for the uh, for winning this? Because they could potentially meet up again in the finals. I think with how the brackets are set up. Let me let me actually scroll down and make sure that's true. I think Innovation just runs through and smashes everyone. Like I don't see anybody beating him after that display. Like okay. maybe in a best of five that's super well prepared for every be... single match. I think Parting can beat him. After you saw I mean, that game, look, Parting with the slash, what did you see? If we have really? parting yeah. versus innovation in the finals in a best of seven, I don't think that GSL could ask for a better final than that. I think it's going to be yeah. Sauce. Sauce or Yoda. You think Sauce is going to... Have you seen... Have you been watching Sauce? I, I did not watch Sauce. I will Sauce admit that. Sauce is a boss. Sauce? <laughs> so, okay. I only watched him against Bomber because I was like, well, I thought Bomber's TVP was pretty good and he got 2 0 so I was curious. Mm. I know. Oh, he played bad this year. No, Sauce played good. Sauce meted the shit out of Bomber. Sauce <laughs> is a thinker. Innovation is a thinker. thinker. Thinkers go far. Sauce, <laughs> I, I am very confident in Sauce's ability. Whoever he gets in his, in his round of eight is he's going to meta the shit out of them and mind game them and do all kinds of things that they don't expect and he's going to own them. And then I don't know what's going to happen after that, but I, Sauce will <laughs> definitely go through. For those not aware, QXC is referencing SOS. Isn't that isn't his name Sauce? It's SOS, I believe. Sounds like Sauce. 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 He's saucy. <laughs> uh, I mean, to be honest, also, and this is maybe the effect of Group B, but like, I look at Group A and Group D, and I'm not even excited. Yo. Roro and Yoda are both. Super okay, sick. that's okay. Roro, Did Roro that's true. Win the last GSL. I skipped over his GSL name. GSL champion. Are you kidding me? I skipped over his name. Admittedly, and Yoda just That'll won. Be good. I am beating his MVP in first. Really, really, JP? You're not excited for that? Compared to Group B, I'm not excited for that. Now, <laughs> maybe Roro will come out and be like, "I'm gonna take a shit in your mouth, Yoda," and then I'll be excited for it. I don't know but what he's group not going D to is, do that. Though. It was like group D is like the group of rejects. <laughs> oh, Symbol, Sue, King Ho, and Gumi Ho. Well, King Ho is Losira. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. After he got a haircut but, or something, I don't know. It's same for me that like group A has really good players. You have a GSL champion, you have Sulky who's really sick, playing really good as well, Yoda. Um, the Intel Extreme Masters World yeah, Championship okay, winner. Group A is pretty good. But, but if I look at it, like I don't particularly want to see the games because even though these players are really good, I've never heard them say a single word. Like, I don't <laughs> know what they are like. And they might have their own style and be really good at the game, but it doesn't help um, me wanting to watch more of their games. So, in the end, I will probably watch some of these games, but not be super hyped about it. Uh, and same for Group D. Well, not having a Protoss in there, not going to help either. Well, for me. let's hope for the... I guess just for my fun factor, that parting and innovation meet in the finals of GSL, CODES, a.k.a. the WCS Season 1, Korea of GSL, whatever the fuck the name is. Um, QXC, I know you got to go, so we'll run through these real quick. I don't know if we're going to have much to say on them anyways. Um, I feel like since WCS, EU, and America have actually started to show games, 
everyone's already forgotten about like the initial start for the qualifiers. They're just like, guys, we actually have games now. We can watch and not... Like, they're so much more interested in that. Did you, you guys already do a state of the game where you talked about the WCS North America qualifier? Uh, I mean, no. If you want to reference it, you can. If you want to talk I about mean, it. All I'd be saying are negative things and how it was. Okay, yeah. I mean, that was we definitely did that. Things we like that. So <laughs> we're we definitely shit on it. I think we're past that though, as a community. With our with our. Um, QXC is not. QXC is not. But <laughs> as a community, we're we're definitely past that. Um, and I'll come around in two weeks again. Yeah, <laughs> I will say that uh, both, well, especially you guys over at uh, WCS Europe, like. From day one till now, it's like night and day. You guys have stepped it up from production to, as casters. The games have been pretty awesome. Um, I definitely think that that right now, uh, compared to America, is the better show. I'll, I'll say that. Um, and probably catch some shit from all my uh, ex-employees over at MLG, but it's well, okay. So, so would you say that where EU is now is better than where America is right now? Because EU started earlier, so they've had more time to... That's definitely... Kinda... A... That's true. Uh, Fix some stuff. And yeah, I actually would. Well, yeah. but and MLG technically, playing devil's advocate, had time to look at what we were doing and saying, "Ah, oh, maybe we could do some of that." It's definitely true. Probably not. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, regardless, though, it, both both tournaments are progressing along production-wise, and each day is getting better and better. Um, yeah. I, I will say that, and I, I think this is a pretty common observation, that WCS Europe, the games are better and they're more interesting than WCS, uh, WCSNA have been thus far, just because of like the, the talent pool inside of it. Um, but that's not to say WCSNA doesn't have good matches. Like Moonglade versus Illusion, the second time they met last night was very entertaining. Um, I really want to see man. Group G... Uh, with Huck and Crank in it, that's going to be a lot of fun. Group C will be fun just because Idra's in it, and he's got a lot of fun uh, opponents with Ghost User, Pult, and Revival. Um, th there's definitely some interesting matches coming up. I think tonight is Killer Major Hero at Alive, so that might be fun. We get to see Major play and see kind of how Korea yeah, that'll be interesting, has actually, treated him. He hasn't really been playing foreigner stuff since he's been in Korea. He hasn't yeah. played mm -hmm. anything. He hasn't played anything, Korea. exactly, yeah. He's we don't played really know. one or two Pro League matches. Did he? Do you know offhand if he won those by any chance? Uh, the one that I saw, he lost. Yeah, against Terminator, right? Yep. Oh, apparently there was a a new patch note that was. Is this today? There's a what? Oh boy, there was a call to action balance testing for today. Is this with really? the Oracle thing, or is this something uh, else? Yeah. I, let's let's finish WCS. I mean, for for EU, Todd or uh, Kalaris, do you guys have anything to add in other than the games have been pretty awesome thus far? Um, I think that well, to go on record saying that it's still a work in progress. Like we're mm -hmm. always we we are in a lot trying to look for new ways to you know step things up and stuff like that. Uh, and there's also a lot of comparisons going around. Of like, well, Korea's just better than EU and NA, guys. I don't know what to tell you. But you also have to remember that Korea hasn't really changed anything from GSL. It's still <laughs> right. just GSL. It's <laughs> exactly. And they've, had, they've been doing that for the past two and a bit years, guys. Like, we're trying to catch up with their work in like Do you ever watch their weeks. stuff just to see if you can get some ideas from it? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, like... <laughs> Are you like trolling this? <laughs> All right, but... That was a very subtle troll. Oh, that was pretty good, yeah. Um, but like that's that's where we want to end up being, right? That's the level that we want to be at. Obviously, the games are never really going to be at that level. We can probably say that quite conclusively. Um, but still, the the production is always kind of rising, and uh, we're looking to do some good stuff in the round of sixteen. So, cool, cool. Um, yeah, and you guys are done. You guys had your final broadcast today, right, Kalaris? Uh, for this week, yeah. For this week? Uh, okay. I think WCSNA has one more broadcast tonight, and then they are done till Monday? Yeah, the 6th. So uh, tune into that. Like I said, tonight will be a fun match because we get to see Major um, 
and Hero and Alive are also in there, so it should be pretty good games. But uh, real quick, I do want to visit this call to action thing that they just put up. Um, first change in it, Spore Caller damage increased from 15 plus 15 uh, to versus Biological. Plus 100. To 15 plus 30 versus Biological. Wait, where is this? If you I, linked you it in, I linked it in Wait, the so chat. Is this is this we're testing it or is this in now? We've just published a custom version of Akalon Waste, oh, okay. in which we are testing small balance changes to StarCraft Two Heart of the Swarm. So yeah, this is basically just for ZvZ. Both or wait, Gee. sorry, is there another change? Uh, well, I mean, there's more changes, yeah, but I'm just talking about this specific change. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that one is absolutely just for ZvZ. how many? How much HP do uh, Mutalisk have? Is it 80, 120? Uh, 120. 125, perhaps? So it does 45, so three shots from a Spore Crawler will kill one Muta. Is that accurate? Chat will correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's 120. That's pretty intense. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of damage. That's actually... It's 125. All right. That's pretty ridiculous. Um, if Zerg players don't make Mutas, what are they, they going to make? They'll go back to Roach Hydra, man. Yeah. <laughs> How is, is that it, better? I don't know. I don't know well, how it's the better. The thing is, you're still going to get map control with mutas. Because it's not like you can move out. You can't like put your sport rollers yeah. like, in the middle of the map. It was always... The the problem in ZVZ is that the mutas always come out when you're tr like trying to take a third. And there's always that wave of lings that go over to try and deny the third. And then, then the mutalisks come along and deny it again. You can't... <laughs> Unless you're starting to spread creep around there with overlords, then you can't put spore crawlers there to start denying it, uh, the mutalisks from do actually doing damage. So I mean, you could do like a heavier queen opening that also gets you more creep spread. Like, I, I guess the thing that I'm saying is, if you look at the way people play ZVZ right now, then yes, the things you just said are true. But it may allow for like a fundamental strategic changing. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry, I had to shut the door because the dog is going to be retarded and I don't want any more noise coming in. Uh, the next change, Burrow research decreased from 100 to 100 to 50 50. Look, guys, Blizzard oh, really my. wants you to actually burrow uh, shit, okay? I, I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> be okay. I, can't, I can't wait yeah. to a point <laughs> when nobody can take an expansion without detection ever again. I'm, I'm just going like, to say. That's because you play Zerg. Like, Blizzard, <laughs> please, like. Burrowing units underneath buildings is not fun for viewers. It's not fun for players. Like, <laughs> it's gonna it's happen. It's just so an annoying mechanic in the game, and it's gonna like that's what a change like that is gonna lead to. Yeah. Fucking burrowing things everywhere. <sighs> I've already got plans personally. But... Oh my god. Wait. So what was the? Can you JP? Can you say the cost decrease again? It's one hundred, one hundred currently to fifty, fifty. So it's a fifty percent decrease. Mm, is the time change at all? No. Okay. Just the cost. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So we're still millionaires anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! The other uh, couple of changes here is the oracle movement speed increased from. Oh, 3.375 no. to 4, and Oracle so Acceleration old. increased from 2 to 3. Um, I think that Oracles were good enough already, but well, did they mention why they did this? Or any uh, particular let's reasons? see. Of all the changes we proposed last week, the Oracle speed increase seemed to receive the most diverse feedback. We'd like to take this opportunity. Oh, they're actually addressing a lot of it. Um, we've, we're already seeing more seeing proxy Stargate openers, and we'll, we'll see these tactics more frequently with this change. Um, Oracle all-ins are really strong, and a speed increase will make these strategies even stronger. These are, I guess, comments that people have said. Um, if they increase the speed, it's an incentive not to proxy the Stargate, because the Oracle is going to be fucking fast anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, the reasoning is... is how, much, how much faster is it now? 3.375 to 4. So. Oh, that's actually not a huge... Change. Well, the acceleration like increased from two to three. Yeah, oh, well, actually, jump. the acceleration is significant. More for micro than like getting across the map. Mm. Or the the last one, oracles would be near impossible to counter with ground units if the Protoss player micros perfectly. <laughs> Do oracles still die in one mine? I think so. So yeah, 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 yeah really that's matter. a ground unit, right? Yeah, I like blizzards. 
This actually sounds pretty cool and helps differentiate the Oracle from other harass units in the game. <laughs> Oracles can also be one of the easiest harass units to deal with, depending we on how you We decided to make one of our units invincible. <laughs> we think, we think it's going to be really cool. <laughs> hey, but um, the, the hallucinated Oracle is going to be faster as well now, James. Oh, that's also true. Oh, Todd likes his hallucinated Oracles. <laughs> um, it's so sick. People always overreact. <laughs> we also feel that the Oracle becomes increasingly interesting as a unit in situations where it constantly is threatened to pick off small groups of units of workers, scout bases, or track army movements, movements with revelation. That said, a Viking or a few Moodalisk are all it really takes to shut down oracles in this situation. They say, overall, we feel these changes will help the oracle become more core to the game and give players a lot more uh, to analyze during games in which Protoss players make use of oracles. Our hope for the oracle is that it will be a unit that greatly rewards players who micro really well. All right. I guess it'll well. make revelation a lot stronger in the late game as well, because you'll see people mixing in one, just darting in and out, and Trying to get the good yeah, revelation. Revelation is a sick ability. Yeah. Yeah. Did, Especially with Tempest. Did Parting use that at all last night in, in any of the, his matches, Todd? Did you ever see an Oracle even made? Yeah. Uh, um, not too often. When people made Oracles, it was almost always as an all in. There was, in uh, the first MLG that was played on Hollow Swarm, MC oh, used uh, yeah, yeah. the Stargate opener in a way that made it look very viable in the long term, where he basically got the one or two Oracle, and then he followed it up with Phoenixes. Yeah, okay, uh, I remember that. Yeah. Trying to counter the mines using mm. the Revelation spell to and basically vision. see the mines, lift them, kill them, and do more harassment on the workers. The thing is, if you open Stargate and go Oracle and you don't do damage, there is a lot of build orders against which you're going to find yourself very far behind versus Terran. Um, and from there, it's very hard to win if you open Stargate and you invest into those gas heavy units. So doesn't uh, affect too much uh, the versus Terran matchup, I think, uh, the changes they offer. But maybe in Protoss versus Protoss is going to be stronger. Um, I don't know what the speed is like compared to Phoenix right now, but in Protoss versus Star Protoss, uh, Stargate is pretty popular right now. So maybe if, if, this, if it, these changes make uh, Oracle a bit stronger, especially versus Phoenix, then... Uh, the, it could change so, something, but other than that, I don't just don't really see it. Phoenix is 4.25 speed. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, so Oracle is still going to suck. Just to give you uh, an idea of like how significant that movement speed increase, it's the same movement speed increase that they gave to Mutas, I think. Wait, or did they go from that? 4 to 4.25? Let's, let's look. The amount is the same. I'm not sure if the actual numbers, though. Um, Mutas are now... They're currently four right now. Four? So they'll be the same speed as Mutas? Is uh, that true? Yeah. Yeah. That seems significant. Yeah. Um, and they used to be 3.75. Yeah, so it is the same change. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, must be pretty good because Mutas are good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and do uh, some shout outs because, like I said, I know... Um, QXE, we said it would be short, and then we kept you for another 35 minutes. So. <laughs> That's okay. I started practicing. Okay. QXE, why don't you uh, start shoutouts? I'm Complexity QXE with Complexity Gaming. Thanks for watching State of the Game. Thanks for having me on, JP. Big shout-out to Complexity Gaming sponsors, which are loading on my browser. I was going to say it, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> Man up. Man the fuck up, man. Good Big job. Big shout-out to Sound Blast from New Egg Origin, PNY Creative, Twitch, QPad, and Crash the System, and Nation Voice. Check me out on Twitch. I'm ColeQXC, and on Twitter, at Cole underscore QXC. I also do do coaching, and I do replay packs if you subscribe to my Twitch channel. So do those things if you're interested. Thanks. Cool. Check them out. Uh, Kalaris, let's do some shout-outs. Okay, thank you very much. My name's Kyle Laris, or Jamie Lannister, as a lot of people end up dubbing me uh, in a lot of casts <laughs> and stuff like that. ESL thought they'd lend me a helping hand by grabbing Todd for the casting at WCSEU, which was very, very nice of them. Was it a and helping hand? Was it? It, it really, really was. Okay. I really needed it. Okay. All right, so... <laughs> pardon? Were you you really needed a hand. Didn't I really you? needed a hand. Okay, I don't... Okay, whatever. Guys, <sighs> shout-outs, focus. God damn it. <laughs> All right, shout-outs to ESL. Thanks very much for hiring me. 
<laughs> and um, yeah, that'll pretty much do it. Make sure to tune in, guys, for WCS EU. We're live Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week with the final round of 32 groups. 6 p.m. Central European Summertime. Todd, let's talk about this hand a little bit more. Have you been helping out uh, Kolaris some? Uh, yeah. Hand? I do lots of analysis during the games that we cast uh, in the WCS EU. If you haven't been watching, check it out. Uh, the VODs are up on... James, help me. ESL.wcs.esl.eu. Okay. Oh, man. I thought yeah, you guys were going to like, try to decipher what URL ESL decided to use this week, because, man, they have a fucking... <laughs> uh, I recently joined the team, Team XMG, so give them a like on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash XMG. If you want to follow me, facebook.com slash Johan Merlo, twitter.com slash Todd SC2. I have my own YouTube channel where I made some tutorials before I moved to Germany and my computer got stuck in the office, so these days I'm not making any more, but if you want to check the ones that I made before, youtube.com slash Todd Starcraft. And that's pretty much it. Thank you for having me on the show, uh, JP. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you all for coming on the show this week, and I uh, look forward to watching you two cast WCS EU as well as QXE playing in Shoutcraft America, and hopefully you crush Group D and move on. You're gonna watch Ravens and losers. Oh yeah, you gotta use your Ravens. <laughs> oh God, we'll see you guys next week. I will announce who's gonna be on the show and uh, what time we'll go live on Monday. And what is there anything else I need to? Oh, if you play uh, Planet Side 2, it's free to play. Uh, I'll be doing Fan Friday tomorrow at 8 p.m. EDT, giving away games to subs. So check that out. Other than that, I think that is about it. So I will see you guys next time. Once again, thank you to Todd, Kolaris, and QXE. Do go follow them on Twitter and all the other various projects they do. We are out. Good night. Peace.